What's up, everybody? Big, big facts, man. So, Bond First Nim, Reggie Wright just did a video on Tupac and Stretch and indicating Tupac uh, was involved in the murder of Stretch. Well, and, you know, this all stems back to that Quad Studio shooting. And uh, I remember this, this ma when this magazine came out. I bought this magazine. I remember it like yesterday. I read it. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what, what happened to it, but it was great, bruh. I mean, those were the times. But uh, this article, Tupac told what really happened. And some people would consider that snitching. Dry snitching or whatever. But in this interview, he told what happened during that Quad Studio shooting. And how everything led up to, to that event. And... Uh, I didn't see I when I when I you know as I remember I didn't I didn't uh Tupac didn't suggest that stretch set him up you know in his article you know what I'm saying so I'm gonna go ahead and just and I don't I don't know how the cell phones work back then you know just the Isaac saying stretch was giving them a play by play of where they at but that wasn't really needed you know what I mean I don't know if they, ha you know, Tupac don't say that. You know what I'm saying? So let's go ahead and just go back to this beautiful article by Kevin Powell. And I'm going to say the real names. Kevin Powell changed the names. He said he changed it. He edited the names out because Tupac was saying the real names. So Booker was a uh, Haitian. Well, Booker was a uh, um, Jimmy Henchman. And Nigel was Haitian Jack. So let's go ahead and kick it off, man. After the trial and the shooting and the media, media storm, Tupac Shakur is alive and well. Hay says, he says, Thug Life is dead and that his new album, Me Against the World, may be his last. But Tupac's pulling no punches in this exclusive prison interview by Kevin Powell. Tupac was thinking about suicide, y'all, in prison. That's why he said that. It was ch it was a chilly January morning when I made my way to Rikers Island for a conversation with Tupac Shakur. What would be his first words to any journalist since being shot last November 30th? After passing through a series of checkpoints and metal detectors, I reached a dingy white conference room in the same building building where Tupac was being held on three million dollars bail. Within weeks, he'd receive a one and a half to four and a half year sentence for a sexual abuse conviction in his New York rape case. Tupac strutted into the room without a limp in spite of having been recently wounded in the leg among other places dressed oh yeah by the way he wasn't shot in the balls as people think he he didn't get shot in the balls he got shot in his thigh damn near near his balls but he didn't get shot in the balls y'all dressed in a white adidas sweatshirt and oversized blue jeans he seemed more alert than he had been in all our interviews and, and encounters, he looked me in the eyes as we spoke and smoked one new port after another. I'm kind of nervous, he admitted at one point after a brush with death and the barrage of rumor and in the window that followed. Tupac said he summoned me because this is my last interview. If I get killed, I want people to get every drop. I want them to have the real story. Let's go, Pac. Let's do it, bro. How do you feel? So this is oh, so. How do you feel after everything you've been through these past few weeks? Kevin Powell asked. Well, the first two days in prison, I had to go through what life is like when you've been smoking weed for as long as I have, and then you stop. Emotionally, it was like I didn't know myself. I was sitting in a room like there was two people in a room, evil and good. I told y'all about that dual personality of Tupac. 
that was the hardest part. After that, the weed was out of me. Then every day, I started doing like a thousand push-ups for myself. You know, sometimes I think Tupac should have just did his time, man. He was more clear-headed when he was in prison. He said he started doing a thousand push-ups. I was reading whole books in one day and writing and writing. And that was putting me in a peace of mind. Then I started seeing my situation and what got me here. Even though I'm innocent of the charge they gave me, I'm not innocent in terms of the way I was acting and the way he handled the situation. Could you tell me specifically what you mean? I'm just as guilty for not doing nothing as I, as I am for doing things. Not with this case, but just in my life. I had a job to do and I never showed up. I was so scared of this responsibility that I was running running away from it. But I see now that whether I show up for work or not, the evil forces are going are going to be at me. They're going to come 100%. So if I don't be 100% pure hearted, I'm going to lose and that's why I'm losing. Damn. Prophetic words. You know, this is real because Tupac was running from his role of being a leader to black people. That's why he was saying, that's why he said, I was so scared of this responsibility. Yeah, because the man was a leader. The man had the brains to lead. You know, he had the brains to be a MLK or Malcolm X. But like he said, he was scared of that responsibility. He didn't, he didn't want that weight on his shoulders. You know what I mean? He didn't he didn't want He didn't want want that responsibility. He wanted to be wild, do his thing, make money, fuck bitches. He didn't want to live up to He didn't want to he, he didn't want to live up to this hero like figure. This straight and narrow hero like figure that lead this Moses like figure that lead the wild out. You know, he didn't want to live up to that. Either way, you're going to die. You know what I mean? However you live, we all going to die. But, he, like he said, he, he didn't want the responsibility of that. But like he said, but I see now that whether I show up for work or not, the evil forces are going to be at me. Yeah, man. They took over your body. And you let them win. They're going to come 100%. So if I don't, when I say you let, you let him win, look who he joined, bro. He joined the devil, death row. He joined death row, bro. That speaks for itself. You go to death row. Ironic, right? Because he died. And Suge is seen as the devil with that red suit. Come on, bro. It's like he sold his soul to the devil. You know what I mean? The evil forces are going to be with me. They're going to come at me 100%. So if I don't be 100 So he really pretty much, when he when he contacted Shug, he made a deal. Okay, I'm just going to sell my soul, man. And he started act, acting like a devil when he got to death row. Beating up people. It's a lot of stories y'all don't even know. They don't, be, they don't get talked about. Of what Pop was on, man. When I got in here, all the prisoners was like, fuck that gangster rapper. I'm not a gangster rapper. I rap about things that happened to me. I got shot five times, you know what I'm saying? People was trying to kill me. It was really real like that. I don't see myself being special. I just see myself having more responsibilities than the next man. People look to me to do things for them to have answers. I wasn't having them because my brain was half dead from smoking so much weed. <laughs> I'd be in my hotel room smoking too much, drinking, going to clubs, just being numb. That was being in jail to me. I wasn't happy at all on the streets. Nobody could say they saw me happy. 
when I spoke to you about a year ago, you said that if you ended up in jail, your spirit would die. You sound like you're saying the opposite now. That was the addict speaking. Go ahead, Pop. The addict knew if I went to jail, then it couldn't live. Go ahead, Pop. The devil was in you. The addict in Tupac is dead. The excuse maker in Tupac is dead. The vengeful Tupac is dead. The Tupac that would stand by and let dishonorable things happen is dead. Uh-huh. God let me live for me to do something extremely extraordinary. And that's what I have to do. Even if they give me the maximum sentence, that's still my job. And this is an excerpt. If we really are saying rap is an honor, I ain't going to read that yet. But you hear? So when he got back to death row, he just did everything. He just did the whole opposite of what he said right here. He just went back to his devilish ways. Why you let the devil win, Pac? Why, bro? Bro really sold his soul, man. I, even though he's a legend, we talking about him. He really made the wrong. It, it, and that's what life's all about. Your your choices, man. You're going to either swallow the red pill or the blue pill. Your choices affects a whole different reality. Now, had he chose a different route, he, he would have a whole nother reality. You know what I'm saying? You got to be careful of your choices that you make in life. Because your choices will put you in a whole nother reality. A whole nother you know, dimension. Can you take us back to that night at Quad Recording Studios in Times Square? The night of the, the night of the shooting? Sure. Ron G is a DJ out here in New York. He's like Pac. I want you to come to my house and lay this rap down for my tapes. I said, Alright, I'll come for free. So I went to his house, me, Stretch, and a couple other homeboys. After I laid the song, I got a page from this guy, Jimmy, Jimmy Henchman, telling me he wanted me to rap on Little Sean's record. Now this guy, I was going to charge because I could see that they was just using me. So I said, all right, you give me seven G's and I'll do the song. He said, I got the money, come. I stopped off to get some weed and he paged me again. Where you at? Why you ain't coming? I'm like, I'm coming, man. Hold on. Did you know? Okay, I see right there. You didn't. He didn't talk about stretch. Wanted me to go to the studio to meet up with Jim. He ain't say nothing about stretch. This is between Pac and Jimmy, and Jimmy initiated that that page. Jimmy page pop. Stretch ain't got nothing to do with that. So Jimmy page pop to do a song, right? To get on the court, get in the studio. Did you know this guy? I met him through some rough characters I knew. He was trying to get legitimate and all that, so I thought I was doing him a favor. But when I called him back for directions, he was like, I don't have the money. I said, well, if you don't have the money, I'm not coming. He hung up the phone and called me back. I'm going to call Uptown Entertainment, Andre Harrell, and make sure you get the money. But I'm going to give you the money out of my pocket. So I said, all right, I'm on my way. As we're walking up to the building, Somebody screamed from up to the top of the studio. It was Little Caesars. It was Little Caesar. Biggie's side man. That's my homeboy. As soon as I saw him, all my concerns about the situation were relaxed. So, Tupac had concerns. He had, you know, he didn't really trust Jimmy Henchman, but he was coming up there anyway, you know, see what was up, get this money. 
So you're saying that going into it, I felt nervous because this guy knew somebody I had major beef with. I didn't want to tell the police, but I can tell the world. Haitian Jack had introduced me to Booker. Everybody knew I was short on money. All my shows were getting canceled. Okay, now who was this guy he had major beef with? What is was was it Haitian? Who was it? Everybody knew I was short on money. All my shows were getting canceled. All my money from my records was going to lawyers. All the movie money was going to my family. So I was doing this type of stuff, rapping for guys and getting paid. Okay, so pretty much Tupac and Haitian Jack fell out uh, after what happened to Ayana. Ayana. And I, I think Tupac is alluding to that. They fell out. They had beef. Because Haitian put Tupac in a bad spot. Jeopardizing Tupac's career. You know what I'm saying? Bringing that girl around. Now the girl accusing him of rape. So Tupac going to blame Haitian Jack for that too. So I think that's when they fell out right there. And that's who Tupac talking about. So we, I, he had major beef with uh, Haitian Jack, I'm thinking. So Tupac was desperate pretty much. He needed some money. So that's why he went up there. Who's this guy, Haitian Jack? I was kicking it with him the whole time I was in New York doing Above the Rim. He came to me. He said, I'm going to look after you. You don't need to get in no more trouble. Doesn't Haitian also go, doesn't Jack also go by the name of Trevor? Right, there's a real Trevor, but Jack took on both aliases. You understand? So that's who, who I was kicking it, kicking it with. I got close to them. I used to dress in baggies and sneakers. They took me shopping. That's when I bought my Rolex and all my jewels. They made me mature. They introduced me to all these gangsters in Brooklyn. I met Jack's family, went to his kid's birthday party. I trusted him. You know what I'm saying? I even tried to get Jack in the movie, but he didn't want to be on film. That bothered me. I don't know any nigga that didn't want to be in the movies. Can we come back to the shooting? Who was with you that night? I was with my homeboy Stretch. His man Fred. I think that's E Money Bags. Fred is E Money Bags. And my sister's boyfriend Zaid. Not my bodyguard. I don't have a bodyguard. We get to the studio. And there's a dude outside in army fatigues with his hat low on his face. When we walked to the door, he didn't look up. I never seen a black man not acknowledge me one way or the other, either with jealousy or respect. But this guy just looked to see who I was and turned his face down. It didn't click because I had just finished smoking chronic. I'm not thinking something would happen to me in the lobby. While we're waiting to get buzzed in, I saw a dude sitting at a table reading a newspaper. He didn't look up either. These are both black men. Black men in their 30s. So first I'm like, these dudes must be security for Biggie. Because I could tell they were from Brooklyn from their army fatigues. But then I said, wait a minute. Even Biggie's homeboys love me. Why don't they look up? I pressed the elevator button, turned around, and that's when the dudes came out with the guns. Two identical 9 millimeters. Don't nobody move. Everybody on the floor. You know, you know what time it is. Run your shit. I was like, what should I do? Okay, so that's the Isaac talking about. Um, Stretch was giving them a play-by-play -play and all that, where they was at. But I don't know, bro. It's hard. It's hard to tell. Because some people said they didn't even have no damn cell phones in the 94. How was Stretch? They had, maybe they had those big old ass cell phones. You know? But like I said, Pac don't, don't say nothing about Stretch 
he believed Stretch set him up because Stretch was talking to hey, to, to uh, Jimmy. He didn't say nothing about that. Tupac was talking to Jimmy. Tupac said he was on his way. Yeah, where the setup at? Ain't no setup. Well, where the Stretch set up at? Stretch didn't have to set him up. Oh, wait, I, I say, I say, Tupac got mad because Stretch started running with Jimmy after this happened. After this happened, you know, he started hanging over there. And it looked like he was down with Jimmy the whole time. But this is not no setup from Stretch. This is a setup from Jimmy. Okay. So I'm thinking Stretch is going to fight. He was towering over those niggas. From what I know about the crim criminal element, if niggas come to rob you, they always hit the big nigga first. But they didn't touch Stretch. They came straight to me. Everybody dropped to the floor like potatoes, but I just froze up. It wasn't like I was being brave or nothing. I just could not get on the floor. They started grabbing at me to see if I was strapped. They said, take off your jewels, and I wouldn't take them off. The light-skinned dude, the one that was standing outside, was on me. Stretch was on the floor, and the dude with the newspaper was holding the gun on him. He was telling the light-skinned dude, shoot that motherfucker, fuck it. So, okay, he holding the gun on Stretch. See, this is what I'm saying. Why would he set Stretch up? Why would Stretch have set this up if the man is holding the gun on him? Well, uh, you know, like, like I said, man, I don't believe that, that that's what it was. He was telling the light-skinned dude, shoot that motherfucker, fuck it. Then I got scared. That reminded me of Menace of Society. When he shoot that motherfucker. Then I got scared because the dude had the gun to my stomach. All I could think about was piss bags and shit bags. I drew my arm around him to move the gun to my side. He shot and the gun twisted. And that's when I got hit the first time. I felt it in my leg. I didn't know I got shot in my ball. See, Tupac, and Tupac didn't say nothing about he had a gun on him. He didn't say nothing about. It. I haven't read where he said he had a gun on him yet. He didn't say. He didn't say he was strapped. He didn't. He didn't make. He didn't tell Kevin Power. I was trying to get to my gun. I had. I had a strap on me. I was trying to get to it. He didn't. Tupac didn't say that. Now later it comes to find out he had a gun. But it don't say that. And they checked for his gun and they didn't find anything. Right. But he did, but he, okay, I'm going to keep reading because he did have a gun. Okay, let me keep reading. He shot and the gun twisted and that's when I got hit the first time. I felt it in my leg. I didn't know I got shot in my balls. I dropped to the floor. Everything in my mind said, you know what, it did come out, hold up. It did come out later he had a gun because Biggie hid his gun. Biggie hid Pop's gun, yep. I dropped to the floor. Everything in my mind said, Pop, pretend you're dead. It didn't matter. They started kicking me. Okay, let me read this again. He shot and the gun twisted. And that's when I got hit the first time. I felt it in my leg. I didn't know I got shot in my balls. Also, he said he got shot in the balls. But he told his dad he didn't get shot in the balls. I don't, I don't know what's going on. He said he got shot in his leg. Did he get shot? <laughs> Whatever, bro. He said he felt it in his leg. I didn't know I got shot in my balls. So he told everybody he got shot in his balls. <laughs> That's why they were making. That's why people were making fun of him because he the one said he got shot in his balls. I didn't know I got shot in my balls. But he didn't shoot himself in the balls. He said the guy shot. He said he drew his arm around. Him to move the gun to my side. The guy shot and the gun twisted, and that's when I got hit the first time. That's when he got. He said the guy, the one that shot, not him, not him 
shooting itself. I dropped to the floor. Everything in my mind said, Pop, pretend you're dead. It didn't matter. They started kicking me, hitting me. I never said, don't shoot. So that's when they started pistol whipping them. As Stretch was saying. I was quiet as hell. Now only one shot and I went off so far, y'all. They were snatching my shit off me while I was laying on the floor. I had my eyes closed, but I was shaking because the situation had me shaking. And then I felt something on the back of my head, something real strong. They probably That's when they were pistol whipping them. I thought they stumped me or pistol whipped me. And they were stumping my head against the concrete. I saw white, just white. I didn't hear nothing. I didn't feel nothing. And I said, I'm unconscious. But I was conscious. And then I felt it again. And I could hear things now. And I could see things. And they were bringing me back to consciousness. Then they did it again. And I couldn't hear nothing. And I couldn't see nothing. It was just all white. And then they hit me again. And I could hear things. And I could see things. And I knew I was conscious again. Did you ever hear them say their names? No, no. But they knew me or else they would never check for my gun. It was like they were mad at me. I felt them kicking me and stomping me. They didn't hit nobody else. It was like, oh, motherfucker, oh, ah, they were kicking hard. So I'm going unconscious and I'm not feeling no blood on my head or nothing. The only thing I felt was my stomach hurting real bad. My sister's boyfriend turned me over and said, yo, are you all right? I was like, yes, I'm hit, I'm hit. And Fred is saying he's hit, but that was the bullet that went through my leg. So I stood up and went to the door. And the shit that fucked me up, as soon as I got to the door, to the door, I saw a police car sitting so... From what he's saying, he only got, so, so from where Tupac, out of Tupac's words now, he only got shot one time, y'all. That was in the leg. He didn't hear no other bullets go off. He got shot in the leg. And he pretty much got pistol whip, whipped and stomped out. Shot one time in the leg, okay? As, as I'm reading so far. So I stood up and I went to the door and the shit that fucked me up, as soon as I got to the door, I saw a police car sitting there. I was like, uh-oh, the police are coming. And I didn't even go upstairs yet. So we jumped in the elevator and went upstairs. I'm limping and everything, but I don't feel nothing. It's numb. When we got upstairs, I looked around and it scared the shit out of me. Why? Because Andre, Her Andre Harrell was there. Puffy was there. Biggie, there was about 40 niggas there. All of them had jewels on. More jewels than me. I saw Haitian, I saw Jimmy, Jimmy Henchman. And he had this look on his face like he was surprised to see me. Why? I had just beeped the buzzer and said I was coming upstairs. He had that look on, your, on his face because he saw you bleed. He saw something had happened to you. Little Sean bust out crying. I went, why is Little Sean crying? And I got shot. He was crying uncontrollably. Like, oh my God, Pop, you got to sit down. I was feeling weird. Like, why do they want me to sit down? He was concussed, man. Because five bullets had passed through your body. Now see... Uh, Jimmy Powell suggested five bullets. Pop didn't say nothing about no five bullets. Pop didn't say nothing about getting shot five times. Now this Jimmy Powell, whatever his name is, this is the editor, the interviewer saying that. Because five bullets had passed through your body. I didn't know I was shot in the head yet. I didn't feel nothing. I opened my pants and I could see the gunpowder and the hole in my Carl Canai drawers and I didn't want to pull them down to see if my dick was still there. I just saw a hole and went, oh shit, roll me some weed. I called, <laughs> I called my girlfriend and I was like, yo, I just got shot. 
call my mother and tell her. You see I'm going? Alright. If he and, and I think if he had got shot five times he'd be bleeding a lot more, probably probably would have bled to death. You know, but I ain't no telling. Depends on the gun too. Five times is a lot though. For somebody to be getting up there talking about pulling me some weed. Unless he, he got unless he got shot with a little bit of pistol. I ain't no telling, man. But like I said, Kevin Powell's uh first suggested this because five bullets had passed through your body. Five bullets? Hmm. Did the doctor take out five bullets? We got to get that medical report. I don't know. Did the police pick up five shells? I don't know. I'm not down. He got shot five times, but I'm trying to. Tupac ain't say that, though. I did. He Like you said, he didn't know he was shot in the head yet. But we got to keep reading the article. He, he may say that later on. Okay. Roll me some weed. I called my girlfriend. And I was like, yo, I just got shot. Call me, call me. Nobody approached me. I noticed that nobody would look at me. Andre Harrell wouldn't look at me. I had been going to dinner with him the last few days. He had invited me to the set of New York Undercover telling me he was going to get me a job. Puffy was standing back too. I knew Puffy. He knew how much stuff I had done for Biggie before he came out. See, and when I first read this article, I didn't even know Pac and Big knew each other. I was shocked when he said he knew how much stuff I had done for Biggie before he came out. I was like, wow, Pac no Big? Damn. I didn't know that. Because you never saw them together. You know, in a video. Usually, usually back then, the artists would be in videos of, of other rappers that they associated with. And I never saw Big and Pac hanging like that. So people did see blood on you. They started telling me your head, your head is bleeding. But I thought it was just a pistol whip. Okay. Then the ambulance came and the police. First cop I looked up to see was the cop that took the stand against me in the rape charge. He had a half smile on his face. And he could see them looking at my balls. He said, what's up, Tupac? How's it hanging? Ha, <laughs> asshole. When I got to Bellevue Hospital, the doctor was going, oh my God. I was like, what? What? <laughs> and I was hearing him tell other doctors, look at this. This is gunpowder right here. He was talking about my head. This is the entry wound. This is the exit wound. And when he did that, I could actually feel the holes. I said, oh my God, I could feel, I could feel that. It was the spots that I was backing, blacking out on. And that's when I said, oh shit, it shot me in my head. They said, you don't know how lucky you are. You got shot five times. Okay, so the doctor said he got shot five times. That's why he said that. He didn't know he got shot five times. The doctors told him he got shot five times, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Tupac only heard one bullet. Or only heard one shot. Stretching him only heard one shot. Well, they claim he only heard one shot. Tupac says he only heard one shot. But the doctors are telling him he got shot five times. You don't know how lucky you are. You got shot five times. It was like weird. I did not want to believe it. I only could. I could only remember that. I could. I could only remember that first shot. Then everything went blank. At any point, did you think you were going to die? No. I swear to God, not to sound creepy or creepy or nothing. I felt God cared for me from the first time the niggas pulled the gun out. The only thing that hurt me was that stretch and them all fell to the floor. The bullets didn't hurt. Nothing hurt until I was recovering. I couldn't walk. 
I couldn't get up and my hand was fucked up. I was looking on, on the news and it was lying about me. Okay, he got shot. Uh, okay. Well, he got shot five times at. Let's say he got shot in the head. Okay, one. And leg, two. What, what, what are the rest of the shots at? You know what I mean? He didn't say he got shot in the hand. Was his hand bleeding? If you got shot in the hand, you, you're going to have a hole in your hand. Oh, it's, man, I don't know, man. Sometimes these doctors don't be knowing what they be talking about. But he said, uh, said his hand was killing him. I could feel that. It was the spots that I was blacking out on. You got shot five times. Weird. All right. Looking on the news, and they were lying about him on the news. Tell me about some of the coverage that bothered you. The number one thing that bothered me was that dude that wrote that shit that said I pretended to do it. That I had set it up. It was an act. What? They they was talking about that shit way back in the day. You, you, you know you know how when people get hurt, they always talk about oh uh, it, it was an act. You know, uh, that was all a plan. They were doing that back in the day. That I had set it up. It was an act. When I read that, I just started crying like a bitch, like a baby, like a bitch. I could not believe it. It just tore me apart. And then the news was trying to say I had a gun and I had weed on me. Instead of saying I was a victim, they were making it like I did it. See, somebody was snitching already on him. Somebody he had a gun. Come later to find out he did have a gun. And he did have weed on him. But uh, somebody was snitching on Pop. Somebody was telling him. What about all the jokes saying you had lost one of your testicles? That didn't really bother me because I was like, I was like, shit, I'm going to get the last laugh because I've got bigger nuts than all these niggas. My doctors are like, you can have babies. Reggie Wright, he can have babies, Reggie Wright. You said he couldn't have no babies because he got shot in the balls. <laughs> My doctors are like, you can have babies. They told me that the first night after I got exploratory surgery. Nothing's wrong. It went through the skin and out the skin. Same thing with my head. Through my skin and out the skin. Okay. So, uh, he did get shot in the balls. So, the end of that, the dad interview was acting like Tupac didn't get shot in the balls. I guess he was trying to say, well, it wasn't bad. It didn't affect him. His balls are intact. Damn, he got but that's close to your dick though. You lucky you didn't you get your dick didn't get shot off, bro. You fucking lucky. That's crazy. But your head is all bone. I mean, how the hell he gonna go through the skin in your head? That don't make no sense. Same thing with my head, through my skin and out the skin. Your head is full of, of, of all bone, though. Your skull. I, what? That don't make no... Did these doctors know what the hell they were talking about? It, it just don't, it don't make no sense to me, in a way. Have you had a lot of pain since then? Yes, I have headaches. I wake up screaming. I have, I have, I've been having nightmares. Thinking they're still shooting me. All I see is niggas pulling guns. And I hear the dude saying shoot that motherfucker. Then I wake up sweaty as hell. And I'll be like damn I have a headache. Psychiatrist at Bellevue said. That's post traumatic stress. Why did you leave Bellevue Hospital? I left Bellevue the next night. They were helping me. But I felt like a science project. They kept coming in looking at my dick and shit. And this was not a cool position to be in. 
I knew my life was in danger. The fruit of Islam was there, but they didn't have guns. I knew what type of niggas I was dealing with. So I left Bellevue and went to, <laughs> to Metropolitan. They gave me a phone and said, you're safe here. Nobody knows you're here. But the phone would ring and someone would say, you ain't dead yet. I was like, damn, those motherfuckers don't have no mercy. So I checked myself out and my family took me to a safe spot. Somebody who really cared about me in New York City. You notice Tupac didn't talk, didn't say that his dad came to the hospital. He didn't, he didn't mention that. He didn't bring that up. But it's okay. Why did you go to court the morning after you were shot? They came to the bed and said, Pop, you don't need to go to court. I was like, no. I felt like if the jury didn't see me, they would think I'm doing a show or some shit. Because they were sequestered and didn't know I got shot. So I knew I had to show up no matter what. I swear to God, the furthest thing from my mind was sympathy. All I could think of was stand up and fight for your life. Like you fight for your life in this hospital. I sat there in the wheelchair and the judge was not looking me in my eyes. He never looked me in my eyes the whole trial. So the jury came in and the way everybody was acting, it was like a regular everyday thing. And I was feeling so miraculous that I'm living. And then I started feeling they're going to do what they're going to do. Then I felt numb. I said, I've got to get out of here. When I left the cameras, the cameras were all rushing me and bumping into my leg and shit. I was like, you motherfuckers are like vultures. That made me see just the nastiest in the hearts of men. That's why I was looking like that in the chair when they were wheeling me away. I was trying to promise myself to keep my head up for all my people there. But when I saw all that, it made me put my head down. It just took my spirit. Can we talk about the rape case at all? Okay. Jack and Jimmy, well, Jack and Trevor took me to nail, took me to nails. When we got there, I was immediately impressed because it was different than any club I'd been in. It wasn't crowded there. It was lots of space. There were beautiful women there. I was meeting Ronnie Lott from the New York Jets and Derek Coleman from the Nets. They were coming up to me like, Pop, we're proud of you. I felt so tall that night. Because they were people's heroes and they saying I was their hero. I felt above and beyond like I was glowing. Somebody introduced me to this girl. And the only thing I noticed about her, she had a big chest. But she was not attractive. She looked dumpy. Like money came to me and said she looked dumpy like money came to me and said this girl wants to do more than meet you I already knew what that meant she wanted to fuck I just left them and went to the dance floor by myself they were playing some Jamaican music and I'm just grooving then this girl came out and started dancing and the shit that was weird she didn't even come to me face first she came to, she came ass first so I'm dancing to this reggae music you know you know how sensuous that is she's touching my dick she's touching my balls she opened my zipper she put her hands on me there's a little dark spot in nails in the part of nails and I see people over there making out already so she starts pushing me this way I know what time it is we go over in the corner. She's touching me. I lift up my shirt while I'm dancing. Showing off my tattoos and everything. She starts kissing my stomach. Kissing my chest. Licking me and shit. She's going down and I'm like, oh shit. She pulled my dick out. She started sucking my dick on the dance floor. That shit turned me on. 
I wasn't thinking like this is going to be a rape case. I'm thinking like this is going to be a good night. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Soon as she finished that, just enough to get me solid rock hard, we got off the dance floor. I told Jack I've got to get out of here. I'm going to take her to the hotel. I'll see you all later. Jack was like, no, 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 I'm going to take you back. We drive to the hotel. We go upstairs and have sex real quick. As soon as I came, as soon as I came, that was it. I was tired. I was drunk. I knew I had to get up early in the morning. So I was like, what are you going to do? You can spend a night or you can leave. She left me her number and everything was cool. Jack was speaking the night. Jack was spending the night in my room all these nights. When he found out she sucked my dick on the floor and we had sex, he and Trevor were livid. Trevor is a big freak. He was going crazy. All he kept asking me was, did, did, did you fucking ass? He was listening to every single detail. I thought this is just some guy shit. It's all good. Tupac was 5'11", my height. I thought he was around that height. What happened on the night of the alleged rape? We had a show to do in New Jersey at Club 88. This dude said, I'll be there with the limo to pick you up at midnight. We went shopping. We got dressed up. We were all ready. Jack was saying, why don't you give her a call? So we were all sitting in the hotel drinking. I'm waiting for the show. And, and I'm pretty sure he said more. I'm pretty sure they was they was they was uh talking about we all we gonna run a train on that bit. Yeah man, we all gonna fuck, we gonna run a train. I'm pretty sure Pop was having a conversation like that. Yeah, we gonna run a train on that bitch, man. Give her a call. So we all sitting in the hotel drinking. I'm waiting for the show and I just like I I'm waiting for the show and Haitians like I call her. I mean she called me and she's on her way. But I wasn't thinking about her no second time. We were watching TV when the phone rings and she's downstairs. Jack gave Man Man, my manager, some money to pay for the cab, and I was like, let that bitch pay for her own cab. She came upstairs looking all nice, dressed all provocative and shit, like she was ready for a prom date. So we're all sitting there so we're all sitting there talking, and she's making me uncomfortable. Because instead of sitting with Jack and them, she's sitting on the arm of my chair. And Jack and Trevor are looking at her like a chicken, like she's like food. It's a real uncomfortable situation. <laughs> uh, so, Jack, so Haitian had a number. Haitian Jack had a number too. Okay. Interesting. They want to run a train on it. That's what it was. You know what I mean? That's why they were looking. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to take her to the room and get a massage. I'm thinking about being with her that night at Nails. So we get in the room. I'm laying on my stomach. She's massaging my back. I turn around. She starts massaging my front. This lasted for about an, a half an hour in between. We would stop and kiss each other. I'm thinking she's about to give me another blowjob. But before she could do that, some niggas came in. And I froze up more than she froze up. If she would have said anything, I would have said, hold on, let me finish. But I can't say nothing because she's not saying nothing. Oh, shit. Yeah, because they'll be saying, oh, you hate, man. Nigga, you hate, Pop. How do I look saying, how do I look saying, hold on. That would be like I'm making her my girl. Like you cop blocking. 
So they came and they started touching her ass and they going, oh, she got a nice ass. Jack isn't touching her, but I can hear his voice leading it like, put her panties down, put her pantyhose down. I just got up and walked out the room. <laughs> when I went to the other suite, my man told me that Taliba, my publicist at the time, had been there for a while and was waiting in the bedroom of that suite. I went to see Taliba. And we talked about what she had been doing during the day. Then I went and laid down on the couch and went to sleep. When I woke up, Jack was standing over me going, Pac, Pac. And all the lights was out. And all the lights was on in both rooms. The whole mood had, had changed. You know what I'm saying? I felt like I was drugged. Well... Yeah, you felt like you was drugged cuz when you first wake up, you feel dr you feel grog, you still in a you still in like an alpha type state. You know, so you do kind of feel groggy a little bit when you first wake up. I didn't know how much time had passed. And it probably didn't, it probably wasn't that much time had passed. That's why you also feel groggy when somebody wake you up when you just not going to sleep. So when I woke up, it was like, you're going to the police, you're going to the police. Jack walks out the room, comes back with the girl. Her clothes is on. Ain't nothing to her. She just upset, crying hysterically. Why you let them do this to me? She's not making sense. That girl, you can tell, and doing her act, that girl is a weirdo anyway. You know, you can tell she a weirdo. Doing that interview she did with Vlad, she looked like you can tell in her eyes she's kind of a weirdo. I mean, you can tell she a weirdo when she's sucking the man dick on the damn floor. She was a weirdo. Girl, weird. Yeah, and she got those weird eyes. Nigel walks out the room, comes back with the girl, her clothes is on. Ain't nothing to her. She just crying. Why you let them do this to me? She's not making sense. I came to see you. You let them do this to me? I'm like, I don't got time for this shit right here. You got to chill out with that shit. Stop yelling at me and looking at me all crazy, she said. It's not the last time you're going to hear from me and slam the door. That bitch crazy. She one of them psycho, psycho polar bitches, man. And Nigel goes, don't worry about it, Pop. Don't worry, I'll handle it. She just tripping. I asked him what happened, and he was like, too many niggas, you know? I ain't even tripping no more, you know. Niggas start going downstairs, but nobody was coming back upstairs. <laughs> Niggas start going downstairs, but nobody was coming back upstairs. I'm sitting upstairs smoking weed like, where the fuck is everybody at? Then I get a call from Taliba from the lobby saying the police is down here. And that's what landed you in jail. But you're saying that you never did anything. Never did nothing. Only thing I saw was all three of them in there and that nigga talking about how fat her ass was. I got up because the nigga sounded sick. I don't know if she was with these niggas or if she's mad at me for not protecting her. But I know I feel ashamed because I wanted to be accepted and because I didn't want no harm done to me, I didn't say nothing. How did you feel about women during the trial? About how do you feel about women now? And how do you feel about women now? When, when, when the charge first came up, I hated black women. I felt like I put my life on the line. At the time, I made Keep Your Head Up. Nobody had no songs about black women. I put out Keep Your Head, I put out Keep Your Head Up from the bottom of my heart. It was real, and they didn't defend it. I felt like it should have been women all over the country talking about Tupac, couldn't have did that and people was actually asking me did you do it then going to trial I started seeing black women that was helping me now I've got a brand new vision of them because in here it's mostly black female guards they don't give me no extra favors but they treat me with human respect they're telling me when you get out of here you gotta change they be putting me on the phone with their kids you know what I'm saying they just give me love. 
What's going to happen if you have to time? What's going to happen if you have to serve time? If it happens, I got to serve it like a trooper. Of course, my heart will be broke. I'll be torn apart, but I have to serve it like a trooper. I understand you recently completed a new album. So he must. So okay, in this interview, he must was in Rikers Island. He wasn't in Clinton yet. I think the interviewer said that he went to Rikers. Yep, he went to Rikers. So this interview, he was in Rikers. He he wasn't. That's why the guards was cool in Rikers. You know what I mean? So it says right here. I understand you recently completed a new album. You recently completed a new album. Rapping. I don't even got the thrill to rap no more. I mean, in here, I don't even re remember my lyrics. But you're putting out the album, right? Yeah, it's called Me Against the World. So that is my truth. Truth. That's my best album yet. And because I already laid it down, I can be free. When you do rap albums, you got to train yourself. You got to constantly be in character. You used to, you used to see rappers taking all that hard, talking all that hard shit, and then you see them in suits and shit at the American Music Awards. I didn't want to be that type of nigga. I wanted to keep it real, and that's what I thought I was doing. But now that shit is dead. That thug life shit, I did it. I put in my work. I laid it down, but now that shit is dead. What what are your plans after prison? I'm going to team up with Mike Tyson when we get out. Team up with Monster Cody from California. I'm going to start an organization called Us First. I'm going to save these young niggas because nobody else wants to save them. Nobody ever came to save me. They just watch what happened to you. That's why thug life to me is dead. If it's real, then let somebody else represent it because I'm tired of it. I represented it too much. I was thug life. I was the only nigga out there putting my life on the line. Has anybody else been there for you? Since I've been in here, I got about 40 letters. I got little girls sending me money. Everybody telling me that God is with me. People telling me they hate the dudes that shot me. They're going to pray for me. I did get one letter. This dude telling me he wished I was dead. But then I got people looking out for me like Jada Pinkett, Jasmine Guy, Tretch, Mickey Roark. My label, Interscope Records, has been extremely supportive, even Madonna. Can you talk about your relationship with Madonna and Mickey Roark? I was letting people dictate who should be my friends. I felt like because I was this big black panther type of nigga, I couldn't be friends with Madonna. And so I dissed her, even though she showed me nothing but love. I felt bad because when I went to jail, I called her and she was the only person that was willing to help me of that stature. Same thing with Mickey Roark. He just befriended me. Not like black and white. Just like friend to friend. And from now on, it's, it's not going to be a strictly black thing with me. I even apologized to Quincy Jones for all the stuff I said about him and his wives. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm apologizing to the huge brothers. Uh oh. I'm I'm apologizing to the Hughes brothers, but not John Singleton. He's inspiring me to write screenplays because I want to be his competition. He fired me from higher learning and gave my idea to the next actor. Oh, that was your idea. Do you worry about your safety now? I don't have no fear of death. My only fear is coming coming back reincarnated. He got that from uh He got that from the homie mental. <laughs> he got that from the homie mental. Come my only fear of death is coming back reincarnated. He got that from the homie mental. <laughs> I'm not trying to make people think I'm in here faking it. But my whole life is going to be about saving somebody. I got to represent life. If you saying you're going to be real, that's how you be real. Be physically fit. Be mentally fit. And I want niggas to be educated. See how Pop was talking? See how he was talking? He was talking with a good level head on his shoulders. And everything. He said, 
I'm not trying to make people think I'm in here faking it, but my whole life is going to be about saving somebody. You see? I got I got to represent life. If you're saying you're going to be real, that's how you be real. You be physically fit. Be mentally fit. See, he's talking like an angel right here. But when he got out, he started talking like a devil. And I want niggas to be educated. You know, I, you know, I was steering people away from school. You got to be in school because through school you can get a you can get a job. And if you got a job, then that's how they can't do us like this. Do you think rap music is going to come under under more attack given what's happened to you? Oh, definitely. That's why they're doing me like this because if they can't if they can stop me, they can stop 30 more rappers before they even born. But there is something else I understand now. If we really are saying rap is an art form, then we got to be true to it and be more responsible for our lyrics. If you see everybody dying because of what you're saying, it don't matter that you didn't make them die. It just matters that you didn't save them. You mentioned Marvin Gaye and keep your head up. A lot of people have compared you to him in terms of your personal conflicts. That's how I feel. I feel close to Marvin Gaye. Vincent Van Gogh. Why Van Gogh? Because nobody appreciated his work until he was dead. Now it's worth millions. I feel close to him. How tormented he was. Him and Marvin too. That's how I was out there. That's how I was out there. I'm in jail now, but I'm free. My mind is free. The only time I have problems is when I sleep. So you're grateful to be where you are now? It's a gift straight up. This is God's will. And everybody that said I was, wasn't nothing, my whole goal is to just make them ashamed that they wrote me off like that. Because I'm 23 years old and I might just be my mother's child. But in all reality, I'm everybody's child. You know what I'm saying? Nobody raised me. I, I was raised in this society. But I'm not going to use that as an excuse no more. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. And I'm going to make a change. And my change is going to make a change. And my change is going to make a change. Through the community. And through that, they're going to see what type of person I truly was. Where my heart was. This thug life stuff, it was just ignorance. My intentions was always in the right place. I never killed anybody. I never raped anybody. I never committed no crimes that weren't honorable. That weren't to defend myself. So that's what I'm going to show them. I'm going to show people my true intentions and my true heart. I'm going to show them the man, the man that my mother raised. I'm going to make them all proud. Tupac, you talk with a lot of sense. You talk like a god right here. You talk like an angel. <sighs> but you really did the opposite when you got out. When you joined Death Row, when you joined the devil, when you signed your soul, when you sold your soul to Suge Knight, when you sold your soul to the devil, Suge Knight, you know, in symbolic speaking, Symbolically, he sold his soul to the devil, y'all. Uh, he joined the dark side. The, the dark side won against the evil side in Tupac's case. The dark side took over. The dark side defeated the good side. That, and that's sad because Tupac uh, had the potential to be so much more. Had the potential to leave to help so many so much so many more people you know he had the potential to really help a lot of people uh with his charisma with his gift of intelligence with his vision but he chose the dark side and that's a goddamn shame um yeah we love tupac we love the good and the bad of tupac we accept tupac for what he was you know but like I said, in, in life we have choices. And our reality dictates what choice we make. So there's a choice. So And I believe in parallel universes. So there's a choice. So Tupac, there's a reality that 
you know, there's a real we we're in the reality that Tupac joined Death Row, but there's also another rea reality Tupac didn't join Death Row. He did his time and got out, and he probably would have. And there's, you know, what I'm saying, and 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 in that reality, he probably is still alive today, and he's probably in politics. He probably became president. So there's a reality where Tupac is president, where he didn't join Death Row, where he became a positive, great person. And did what he intended to do, and did what he talked about doing in this in this interview. There's the reality out there where Tupac did exactly what he talked about doing in this interview, and there's and, and there's this reality where he joined Death Row. Amazing, ain't it? If anybody out there still listening to this video. Say holla if you hear me. God damn, it's a long video, man. Say holla if you hear me. If you still listening to this video, at the, man, this is crazy. That's crazy. Peace.